Okay, why don't we uh, go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to our second in our series of summer landowner webinars. As you can uh, see, if you're looking at the screen now, uh, today's uh, webinar is Land Investment Opportunities in Your Self-Directed IRA. Upcoming in the next uh, four weeks will include access to capital for beginning farmers and the tax, and tax incentives and tax credits that landlords can obtain uh, by, by leasing to beginning farmers. And then we'll do the farm lease termination and considerations for 2014. On the 29th, then, we'll have our fall land market preview. And finally, we'll wrap up with this series with a Farm Bill update on the 5th of September. A couple uh, housekeeping thing first. If you have some questions as we go through today, if you uh, go to the uh, on the right hand side of your screen, there will be a text box where you can type in type in your question, and we'll get to those at the end. You're not going to be able to ask questions throughout the seminar uh, because everybody will be muted for the for the sake of the quality of the video or the uh, audio. So let's uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. First of all, I want to again welcome everybody and thank you for logging in. The webinar today is titled Land Investment Opportunities in Your Self-Directed IRA. I'm Ron Beach. I'm director of the Separate Account Land Management Division here at People's Company. And joining me as a presenter today is Dan Hanlon. He's a real estate IRA specialist with Midland IRA located in Chicago. So this presentation is really directed to farmland investors, people who purchase farmland. Now some of those will be first time buyers and there's also people taking part today that are planning to buy land for the first time. And everybody is interested in learning how to do that, how to make these investments within your self-directed IRA. Okay, um, let's, there we go. What I've got on the screen now is a picture of why we're actually here. It's because of the income producing and inflation hedging, value appreciating, sound investment opportunity of those farm fields. And if you take the December 2012 average farmland value prices published by Iowa State University of $8,296 an acre, and you multiply that by the 30.7 million acres of farmland in the state, we have a total market cap of farmland in Iowa of $255 billion. Of that, 26% is owned by people 65 to 74 years old, and another 30% is owned by people 75 years and older. So that demographic dictates that in the next 10 to 20 years, $143 billion of land will be changing hands in some fashion in Iowa alone. And this statistic is very consistent throughout all the farming states in the Midwest. And it's access to this $143 billion marketplace of land that People's Company provides to investors. Now, during last week's seminar, I covered information about the current historical land market, how farmland is performed as an investment class and a diversification vehicle, and, and then finally specifically covered how the Separate Account Land Management Program was des designed to assist investors with number one, overcoming the hurdles of how to source land deals, especially off-market deals. Number two, how to assist in managing the asset for optimal income and value appreciation. And then number three, how it benefited farmers by providing an investor source of capital to buy tracts of land that then they, they could then lease. So that webinar from last week's available through the People's Company website, or you can contact me if you'd like to learn more about the separate account land management topic. But while People's Company, we can assist through the separate account program with acquiring and managing land, in order to utilize your self-directed IRA, you need a knowledgeable IRA custodian. It's got to be someone that can set up and manage the IRA portion of the account in order to keep your account in compliance with 
all the regulations. That specialist we found is Dan Hanlon of Midland IRA. I met Dan at the World Money Show in Chicago last year. And then in Jan this past January, he attended our land expo. And since then, we've developed a growing relationship. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dan and have him take us through how to use a self-directed IRA to invest in land. Excellent. Uh, Ron, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, and, am I? Do you want? Uh, to, to, am I getting access to the slides, or do you want me to? Um, or do you want to scroll through them for me? I I can scroll through. I thought that's okay. That's okay. Yep. Okay. All right. All right. Go ahead. So as Ron said, uh, I'm uh, Dan Hamlin with uh, Midland IRA, and I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, how you can go ahead and, and, and use your IRA um, in ways that you may have never thought possible. Um, you, people, most people are surprised to find out that you've always been able to buy farmland and, um, and other types of investments inside of your IRA. And I'm going to talk about that and the rules and, and give some examples going forward. So uh, Ron, I'm going to get started with my disclaimer on the next slide there. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to make um, make note about what it is that Midland IRA is, what we do, um, but I want to first make clear of, of um, some areas which we uh, which which we don't do. Um, so first and foremost, uh, I, Midland IRA is not a fiduciary, uh, nor are we. Uh, do we give investment uh, legal or tax advice? So uh, clients bring their investments to us that they've found um, elsewhere, they've done their own due diligence on, they feel comfortable in investing, and we offer them the vehicle of which to get that done. So um, uh, Ron, you can go on to my next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our, our office where we're located in downtown Chicago. Um, and all of our transactions are handled in office. So um, anytime that you would call into our office, you're not going to be calling into a different uh, call center or uh, another uh, office down the street that's handling your transactions. All your transactions would be handling or would be handled inside of uh, your account with us. We've been doing self-directed IRAs since 2004. Um, the industry itself has really kind of taken off and exploded um, since the um, 2002, 2001 um, era, uh, but you've actually always been able to do this um, for the longest for a long period of time. Um, this was only reserved for uh, the very, very wealthy. Um, a trust department in a bank would do it as an accommodation for someone. But um, as the business uh, and more and more people are looking to do this. Uh, you know, leaders in industry like Midland IRA have been able to do this um, at a low cost to the client. Uh, Ron, so we'll get we'll get going on the next slide there. Um, so our primary role, what what it is that your um, a client pays us an annual fee to do, um, is record keeping. At the end of the day, there needs to be an intermediary between someone's IRA account and themselves. Um, the client directs us on everything that they'd like to do, but we are the bearers of the account who will, will keep records of the account and send the money where the client wants it, wants it to go. So um, our, our primary role is we're, we're issuing the tax forms as needed. Um, we still have an IRA account here with you, so you can make contributions and take distributions from it just like any other account. Um, our role, though, is usually served by, um, or I should say our role in this alternative investment is usually served by the same company which you would have an IRA with elsewhere. For example, if you open an IRA with Fidelity and you buy your stocks and mutual funds through Fidelity, those accounts are being serviced in the same capacity as we are by Fidelity. The only problem is, is Fidelity, um, in that case, wouldn't be willing to hold a piece of farmland. Um, like the types of assets that we specialize in. Uh, so we'll get started here, and I'm going to first start with what it is um, an IRA is. So I'm guessing since you, you um, showed an interest in this webinar, uh, you have a, a general understanding of what an IRA is at least, and maybe several of you or all of you hopefully have an IRA account. Um, but an IRA uh, stands for an individual retirement arrangement. Um, but really, at the end of the day, really what it is is it's a tax-deferred investment account where the government gives you incentives to contribute to a Roth IRA 
and in turn they allow you the ability to invest it in any way that you choose um, without having to pay tax on those earnings on a uh, on an annual basis or on a um, on a consistent basis. The only time that you will pay taxes is when you take a distribution from the IRA account. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so most IRAs are funded by old 401ks. So um, of an IRA, what you can put into an IRA isn't all that much. It's either $5,500 or $6,500 a year, depending on your age. But where most people get a lot of their wealth is with an, uh, with an old 401k or maybe an old pension plan or a 403b of, of sorts, and they can roll that into an IRA. Um, just a general, just a general uh, um, statistic here, um, over 40% of American households have an IRA and that most IRAs are funded by old 401ks. And uh, right now there's a little over $5 trillion just in IRAs. So that's not including uh, 401ks, that's just in IRAs. So there's a lot of money in, in IRAs. And 98% and of those, uh, those accounts are invested into uh, stocks. Okay, so um, the, the types of investments that we'll talk about today are only for, uh, you know, the 2% of all IRA um, accounts. And you'll see there at the very bottom in orange, I listed out Midland IRA Incorporated, SBO, client's name and account number. And I put that on there um, at the beginning because all IRA assets are always titled to the IRA. Uh, when an IRA purchases or invests into an asset, it takes title to the asset. And that will be, that will be made very clear by the end of the presentation when we talk about buying uh, farmland in an IRA. But that titling um, is always consistent whether you're buying a stock or a mutual fund or, or a piece of real estate or maybe you're lending money out of your IRA. That is going to be consistent throughout. So uh, we'll jump jump here, and I want to I'm going to talk about um, the rules regarding IRAs and, and their investments. So uh, most people are very surprised to find out that the that the IRS doesn't list too many things that you can invest in. Um, the only two things that they list that you cannot invest in are life insurance um, or insurance products and collectibles. So anything. Um, like baseball cards and uh, wine collections and uh, uh, stamp collections and that sort of thing. You, or artwork is another uh, common one. You can't buy that sort of thing with an IRA. But practically anything else under the sun you can invest in, you can do it in an IRA. What they're more concerned with is who you're doing your investing with or who might receive benefit from you having made that investment. So these are um, what the IRA or the IRS list as the IRA's disqualified parties. So anytime that, again, that IRA invests and it, it takes title to, like on the previous slide we mentioned, it takes title to, these are the parties that the, um, that the IRS does not want you to buy, sell, lease, exchange, or receive any benefit of. So um, you can see them all right there on the slide. Um, most importantly, it's the IRA holder, uh, his or her spouse, uh, kids and grandkids, parents and grandparents, um, and then any other, um, or and then any uh, entity or company of which those parties own collectively 50% or more of. So um, I'll let you uh, take a look at those there, and we'll talk about on the next slide here um, what it means to do business um, with one of those parties. Um, I mentioned it once before, it's buy, sell, lease, or exchange. Uh, receive any personal use or benefit or extend credit to an IRA. So I'll just give you some quick examples here um, as far as real estate is concerned. So uh, when we're talking about an IRA buying uh, a piece of farmland, uh, you wouldn't be able to buy a piece of farmland that you already have. It would have to be a new deal. Or conversely, if your son had a uh, piece of land that he wanted to sell you, you wouldn't be able to buy that with, uh, with an IRA account only because the government wants there to be an arm's length transaction. Uh, leasing it would also be a big one, um, uh, or provide services would, would be a big one in farmland. If you bought the, a piece of farmland with your own IRA, unfortunately you wouldn't be able to, um, to work the land yourself or lease it to yourself. There would have to be a, um, you'd have to work through th third parties. 
And then uh, finally, the last one I'll go over here is extending credit to your IRA. And that's going to um, be a big one when we, when we talk about obtaining a mortgage to purchase a piece of farmland with an IRA. And I guess we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more at length uh, when we get to that slide. So we'll go on to the next uh, slide. And I'll, I'll show you one thing that can be done. So I, I gave an example here of two of the most famous Chicago inns. Um, here it's Al and Peggy Bundy, and they're they're uh, they're married. Uh, they've been happily married for a while. And but what they want to do is they want to buy a piece of farmland here. And what they're going to do is they're pre since they're prohibited parties, right? So they're disqualified from one another. They can't buy and sell between one another. But what they can do, and this example shows, is that they're buying a piece of land together. They're going to the table together. They're going to buy it from a third party. Um, and then in this example, Al's investing $75,000 from his IRA. Peggy is going to invest $40,000 from her Roth IRA and $25,000 in liquid cash. So this deal is okay because they're buying from a third party. Part, um, excuse me, they're buying from a third party. And what you'll see here is there's actually three different parties that are involved in this transaction. There's Al's IRA there's Peggy's IRA, and then there's Peggy personally, who is treated as a separate party. And any expenses or proceeds, either from the lease or the sale, would just be split uh, uh, pro rata, depending on how much equity they had in the deal. So partnering with disqualified persons is OK, but transacting directly with them is, is, uh, is considered prohibited. So once we got to get that out of the way, I'm. We're just going to jump into some case studies here about how you can buy real estate using uh, a self-directed IRA. And I'm going to talk about the three ways of which you can do this. Um, there's a cash deal where you um, can buy it in, in uh, straight cash. Um, you have enough money in the IRA to complete the 100% of the purchase. Um, I'm going to talk about partnering, which we just went over with Al and Peggy. I'm going to go over that in a little bit more detail and have an example for you. And then finally, I'm going to talk about uh, obtaining a mortgage, uh, not having enough money or only wanting to put aside a certain amount of money to, to obtain a mortgage. You can do that in an IRA. And then finally, as I wrap up, I'm going to talk about um, it, instead of buying real estate with an IRA yourself, you may be able to lend to people who are buying the real estate. So let's get started here with a cash deal from a single IRA. In this example, we have an investor, Bob, and he, with the help of People's Company, he's identified an attractive farmland acquisition, and he's ready to use his IRA for purchase. So you'll see there on the right, those are the steps that, that Bob is going to go through in order to purchase this, this property. And you'll see that it's really not that, that much different than buying a property if you were just to write a, uh, um, a check out of his checking account or, or issue a check out of his savings account. Um, there's one major difference, though, and you'll see it on four. So let's walk through this real quickly. Bob opens a, a Midland self-directed IRA, and he's going to transfer in from his Schwab account. He'll only need to bring over to our company what he needs to get the deal done. Uh, so, Third, there he'll make the offer to purchase the property. And we understand that you know a lot of these may be um, a lot of these may happen before the other, but this is just an example. Um, he's going to make the offer to purchase the property, and then four there is where it gets a little bit different. He's going to give Midland IRA the direction to buy. So he'll f fill out our forms and he'll provide us the closing documents, and then Midland, our company executes the closing and sends the funds to people's company for the closing in this example. So it's a little bit different in, in the fact that Bob doesn't have direct access to this money. He'll need to authorize his IRA administrator to send the check. Uh, but now Bob's IRA owns the property. And these closings can be rather quick. Um, we, we say that it can happen in three days. We've seen them happen a little bit quicker. But the longest part of this process is step two there. It's getting the money from your current IRA over to uh, this IRA. And typically, that takes about a week to two weeks, depending on where it's coming from. So on the next slide here, um, this, is a, this is a big one. It's the IRA owns the property, right? Again, going back to that first slide, 
any time that that, uh, that titling is used, it's titled directly to the IRA. It's completely separate from your own personal assets and liabilities. As far as this, um, the upkeep on this property goes, all income generated get the, gets deposited into the IRA tax-free or tax-deferred. There won't be a tax that's due at the, in the year of which you receive it. And if it's a Roth account, it is totally tax-free. Um, but all the property-related uh, expenses get paid out of the IRA, unless they're paid for um, by the person who's, who's renting the land or leasing the land from you. So that, that includes property taxes. Um, if you're going to be putting any type of work into, into the land, that needs to be paid for out of the IRA account. And, um, and then also, you know, thirdly there, um, the income and expenses can be, uh, can be serviced by a, a, a property manager and they would just send the net proceeds back to the IRA account um, as your return on investment. So those cash deals are pretty cut and dry. Um, they're pretty easy. The, really what it comes down to is it's not much different than writing a check out of your checking account except you're doing it through a company like, uh, like ours. Um, and then any proceeds from that, that investment are 100% going to go back to the IRA, and the same thing is true for any expenses. Um, so we see that uh, it's probably our most common transaction here, but second is partnering, and that's people who want to take a portion of their IRA and invest it either um, with themselves as a partner um, in personal cash or they found a partner elsewhere. So in this example, John and his associate Jay purchased land for $500,000. And John plans to pay cash while, while Jay's portion is going to be using his IRA. You'll see at the deed, uh, the deed down there, it's going to be a, it's going to be a tenants in common situation where Jay's uh, IRA is listed again. You'll see that titling once again here, Midland IRA, for benefit of Jay Wright's uh, SEP IRA as listed as an undivided 50% interest and then John Smith as an undivided 50% interest. So they... As a tenants in common, they own that land. And I put down there in the bottom, um, LLCs are also a common uh, partnering uh, structure, but for this case, we're going to go with the uh, tenants in common. So we'll go on to the next things, uh, slide here. And uh, so this is just a, this, the process, how this process is going to play out. So John re retains People's Company for the property management. So People's Company is just going to take care of all the property management aspects uh, for them. Uh, rents and expenses are handled by People's Company, and the land has an annual positive cash flow of $25,000. So that split, because they own that property 50-50, uh, 12500 uh, for Jay's SEP IRA, and then $12,500 is going to be sent to John annually as his return on investment. Um, Jay's property, Jay, since it was done in, inside of his uh, SEP IRA, he will not, that will not be taxable to him, Well, uh, John's portion would be. Um, and then uh, People's Company sends Jay's share to, uh, to our company to deposit into his account. Um, it's just like a stock that's paying a dividend. In that case, it gets deposited in there. So then two years later, the tenants offer to purchase the property for $650,000. So they made some. Not only are they getting um, the return on investment by leasing it out, but they're, they're now going to sell it at a gain. Uh, the process would be is, is they, the, the sales contact, contract would be uh, executed, and Midland IRA would execute on behalf of Jay, because Jay has his IRA with us. Um, Prior to closing, Jay's going to approve all, the, all of our documents and, and the documents for closing, and then the proceeds from the closing, um, after closing costs, are going to be wired. Uh, John's going to get his share, and then Jay's SEP IRA is going to get his share. So on the next uh, slide, we'll, we'll look at what, what the numbers would look like in this particular uh, scenario. So they initially invested uh, $250,000. They had the cash flow over the, the lifespan there. Gains from the sale, um, they made uh, $75,000 each on that. And then the balance of, of uh, Jay's SEP IRA afterwards is $350,000, and there's no taxes that are due on that. So if you wanted to turn around in the, in the next day and either transfer all that money back to his uh, 
a TD Ameritrade account to buy an, a mutual fund, or he could buy another property through People's Company um, and do it all over again. So um, that's that's just a just a general example. I use the 50-50 uh, split there just to make things easy, but we've seen all all types of uh, of uh, percentages there, and there's not there's not a requirement on on. Uh, the percentage. So we've seen 60, 40, 75, 25, whatever, whatever equity you have in, that's how you determine that, that, uh, um, that share there. So, so that's, a, that's partnering in an IRA. Um, what, the biggest question that we get is the next slide here, though, is what if I need a bank loan? What if I need a mortgage in this IRA? Can I do that? Um, you can. So I, when, you, when you do this, the IRA is not used as a down payment. What the bank looks for is you have to have equity into the deal, and typically that is 40 to 60 percent down. Um, I understand that People's Company has some local banks that they work with that issue these uh, non-recourse loans. But at the end of the day, really what it me what it comes down to is the ability for that property to cash flow, and that the IRA holder or his or her spouse cannot sign a personal guarantee for the mortgage. So that goes back to the um, one of the prohibited transactions that I mentioned that we talk about more in detail later, and that's um, you cannot extend credit to your IRA. You can't pledge your own personal assets for the benefit of uh, of your IRA. And then at the very bottom, uh, UBI, uh, UBIT and UDFI uh, may apply if profits exceed a thousand dollars. So those are two taxes that may apply uh, based off the earnings of the outside funds, so the funds that were not inside your IRA um, uh, and the return on the dollars on those may, may be taxable to you. Um, and, I, and I think People's Company would have a good, uh, good source for you, too, if you had questions, a good bank that, that you could at least talk to, because um, each bank is different as far as what they require for those types of loans. Um, so then finally here, so we talked about the three ways that you can buy real estate with an IRA. You can buy it with cash, you can partner um, with other partners, um, or you can uh, obtain a bank loan. But in this example, this is a, uh, you can lend money out of your IRA. So not everyone is ready to buy land uh, with, with their own IRA, but what they can do is they can lend it to non-disqualified parties and be the, be the bank. Uh, be the bank, so to speak. Um, so this is a way to participate in an investment without committing long term. Um, it, it's a way of avoiding that UBIT tax that I just mentioned on the previous slide. And again, these are all just just general uh, examples and general numbers. We've seen uh, mortgages that have higher or lower interest rates, but typically they're 8 to 15 percent interest and they're shorter in terms so six months to three years. But again, those are just general numbers. They can be really whatever you want. Um, but how it works is the IRA is going to be the lender, so the lender listed on the, the note or the mortgage would be, again, that titling, Midland IRA, FBO, and then the client's name and number. And then the, the borrower would be paying back the IRA, either a percentage of, uh, of uh, an annual percentage, uh, a monthly payment, um, a balloon payment. It, it's really up to, to you and the borrower or the IRA holder and the borrower to, to the terms there. So we'll jump to the next slide here, and this is just some types of uh, types of uh, notes that you can do. Mortgages are most common. Uh, we see secured notes, so maybe you um, you're not able to get first position on the on the um, on the property that you're lending on. Um, so maybe you take machinery or tools as as collateral. Um, we've seen all sorts of things. We've seen gun collections. We've seen tractors. Um, all sorts of things for for uh, security, we have seen a lot of unsecured notes as well. So really, you know, what that just comes down to is how well do you trust the borrower? Um, participation notes and convertible notes, that's a way of um, investing into the overall equity and performance of, a, of an investment um, as being a lender or an issuer of debt rather than being a participant in the, uh, in the deal as an equity partner. Um, and then we'll jump on to the other slide here. And this is the, the next slide. It really just is, reiterates the, the first slide that we showed here. Um, these are just examples and, and just general, uh, general 
types of things that we see, uh, lar larger down payment, shorter in terms, higher interest rates, and that typically if someone's going to be lending money out of their IRA, um, and us as a company, we charge about three to $400 a year to, to service this IRA account. Usually the, the, the lender gets the borrower to pay uh, our, our, our fees and the costs associated with the uh, um, with this type of mortgage. So um, so that's lending out of an IRA. Um, the next slide here is, is one of which is a really hot topic um, when we're talking about illiquid assets. So uh, we consider liquid assets like stocks and mutual funds where if you need cash tomorrow, what you can do is you just log on to your account and sell it. Um, but what about a piece of real estate that may, may not sell as easy as a stock or a mutual fund? Um, and, and it comes time to take uh, distributions from the account. Because when people in a, in a tax deferred or a traditional type of IRA uh, reach the age of 70 and a half, they have to start drawing on it. So distributions, uh, when an IRA holder reaches 59 and a half, uh, they can take, they're able to take distributions from their IRA without paying a 10% penalty. So you reach the maturity uh, phase of this IRA account and you're able to take money from it. Um, except for Roth IRAs, all distributions are taxed at ordinary income. So if you've made any gains inside your IRA account, you're not subject to the capital gains, but you will pay income tax on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis of the amount of money that you take out of the IRA account. Uh, distributions can be made, this is a big one, especially in, in real estate, so distributions can be made either as cash or as an a uh, asset. So I would say 99% of the time, people take cash out of their IRA as their form of a distribution. But you can take real estate if you wanted to. So if you had a piece of land that either, A, you wanted to use one day yourself, maybe, uh, I guess this really wouldn't be the case with farmland, but maybe you found a property that you wanted to uh, live on and retire someday, you could take that as a distribution. Um, or maybe you had a, a property that was really generating a, a really are producing really well for you. You didn't want to part with it, so you didn't want to sell it, so you could take a distribution. But what you could do is take it out as a distribution either in full, like a, pay 100% of the taxes on the value at that date, or you could take it out over a period of time and pay taxes um, like 10% for the next 10, 10 years. You could do it that way. And when you do that, when you pay taxes on it, you are taking it as a distribution and the land gets retitled into your name. So not your IRA, so that titling again, uh, Midland IRA, FBO, is not 100% owner. Um, you may be listed on the deed or maybe uh, uh, retitled over to your name if you paid taxes on it. And then all of a sudden the proceeds would be split uh, depending on how much you own personally. And your personal share of returns would be taxable to you. So um, let's see if I, if I missed anything there. So I think I covered that. Um, this is gonna. This is the process. I don't know, Ron, do you, if you'd like to talk a little bit about sure, this process I can, here. Yeah, I can take it from here. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Dan. Um, what you're looking at now is a, uh, a process map, if you will, where we've combined the, the, uh, the process Midland IRA has for managing these type of accounts with the separate account program we have at People's Company. You can see it's just a step-by-step -step where you establish your, your account with, the, with a Midland who acts as a custodian. And then with People's Company, we identify what type of property you're looking for. We get our management agreement and engagement agreement signed. Then we go out, we source properties, we present the analysis to you as a client. You'll review that. You'll make the decision if you want to pursue it or not. Uh, then we get, you know, once you say yes, it's a go, we negotiate that final purchase. As, uh, as Dan said, Midland actually signs the purchase agreement, and then at People's we facilitate the closing, do the closing documents that you've signed off on, and then uh, Midland, uh, on your behalf, actually sends the money from your IRA. Then we uh, get the farm leased out, we manage the farm, and make the, make the net income payments to the IRA. So throughout the process, uh, you're not turning over any control, you're, just, you're still in charge of, of making decisions and, and directing things. And so really we've created this simple, straightforward, and comprehensive approach. It's very economical, and that allows you to get out into the uh, farmland acquisition and management marketplace utilizing your self-directed IRA. Uh, 
Next, I've got just a 30-second uh, video clip we'll take a quick look at. And so, uh, you know, as you're looking at investing in farmland, if, if this seems to be the answer to some of the hurdles you face in identifying, acquiring, and managing farmland through a IRA, please uh, contact either Dan or myself. Uh, as you can see there on the on the screen now is our contact information. You can go to either one of our websites to to learn more about our companies. And with that, we'll uh, wrap up. And we want to thank you for your time and attention. And and now we're available for for uh, for questions. Well, I want to I'll leave that, that up there for now. And excellent. Um, do we? I'm trying to find. Uh, Let's see here. Where we? Uh, hmm. I don't see any any questions typed in. I I did have a, a couple from from um, from uh, submitted previously, and and one of them, uh, Dan, is about cost. I guess uh, I'll. I'll start and say that the separate account program would have the normal separate account program cost. Uh, acquisition cost uh, is is three percent of the transaction, then the ongoing annual management fee. But Dan, could you cover uh, in a little more detail what the cost with Midland IRA would be for managing the IRA portion? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know. How we we don't make our money off of uh, off of the investment at all. We're we're completely neutral in how uh, how we bill our fees. We charge flat annual fees, and most of our clients um, pay two hundred and ninety five dollars um, per farmland. So if you had one one piece of farmland with us, it would be two hundred and ninety five dollars, and that takes care of all um, expenses or proceeds uh, from the deal. We don't charge per check. So um, if you did find yourself in a, uh, having a lot of expenses, that is included in our annual fee. Um, our setup cost is $50, um, and then we do charge an annual um, a fee for a uh, for a, an IRA account with us, which is $100. So um, on an annual basis, our real estate clients are paying us $395 a year, which uh, is, is you know, in all honesty, it's, it's quite reasonable. And our fees can be paid for either out of the IRA or uh, out of pocket. Okay, thanks, Dan. We've got another question here. You mentioned partnering with yourself. Mm -hmm. What did you mean when you, say that, when you said that? So partnering with yourself, again, uh, keeping in mind that IRA assets are, are different than personal assets, what that means is it, you're going to the closing table um, representing yourself in a, in a share of the property, and then the rest of it is going to be sent by Midland IRA on behalf of your IRA. So simple uh, round example, if you put 50% equity of, of um, personal wealth into, into a deal, and then the other 50% came from the IRA, all the proceeds would be split 50-50. Um, you would get 50% uh, in your own pocket, which would be taxable to you. Um, and then the other 50% would go into your IRA as a return on investment. And again, there's no percentage that it has to be. I just use 50-50 to make it easy. Okay. The next question is valuation at distribution. And there I believe that one is, you, uh, you mentioned that as distribution you can take a portion of the real estate. So how is that valued at that time to, to meet the, I guess, to meet the minimum distribution requirement? Sure. So um, when you do what's considered a taxable event, so that's anything that in, uh, incurs a 1099, um, you do need to get what are our certified appraisals. So you, if you were doing that distribution over a period of time, uh, appraisals are good for 60 days. Um, you would need to have that property appraised, and then you'd pay off of that assessed value. Okay. Okay. So it's based off of. Um, 
the, the value of the date of distribution and and not at the at the uh, purchase price when you originally purchased it. That is one advantage of being in a Roth IRA, however, is if you buy the property and it appreciates greatly, um, in a Roth IRA, you've already paid the taxes on the money, so you won't owe taxes uh, ever again on that money. Okay. And, and one more. Um, the time to set up an IRA with you and roll over from an existing IRA, I think you mentioned a week or two, but uh, it appears the experience has been sometimes that the, uh, the existing custodian doesn't want to let go of that and, and doesn't, uh, you know, so could it be, could it take quite a bit longer than that? And um, from our experience, uh, you know, a week and a half is pretty much the norm. Um, we do, uh, we have an excellent uh, team that follows up uh, diligently on transfers so that there, if there is any hold up, we can, uh, you know, get it get that problem resolved. So our, our average tr transfer time is six days um, from when we send, them, uh, send the transfer out. So there are some outliers on there depending on, on a company that we may have not worked with in the past, but we usually get it taken care of pretty timely. Okay. Well, I don't have any other questions that I see. If, if somebody did have a question or put a question in and I didn't see it or get to it, I, I apologize, but our uh, contact information is there on the screen. Uh, please give one of us a, a call or, or shoot us an email and we'll, we'll uh, deal with your question. So with that, we'll wrap up. I want to thank everybody again for coming. And I just want to let you know that uh, this presentation will be available uh, next week, we, probably on Tuesday on the People's Company YouTube page. So I believe earlier I said it was available through the website. It's actually through the YouTube page. So uh, if you want to look at it again, uh, listen to it, uh, share it with somebody else, you'll be able to do that next week. And uh, again, just thanks everybody for coming and, and uh, you know, look at uh, if there's one of these in the, in the series coming up that interests you, uh, log on again and, and uh, on next Thursday. So Excellent. thank you. Well, thanks for having me.